Thank you very much for being here today. As many of you know, a Sea Alaska Heritage Institute has initiated a series of lectures throughout the year. And the purpose of the lectures are twofold. One, to educate the public as much as we can, of course. Uh, you're going to see in live person today, uh, the, the, uh, uh, Steve Hendrickson will be given a, uh, a lecture today on, on Clinkett war armor, war helmets in particular. The, the reasons are, are, as I said, twofold. One, you're going to see it in person today, but it's going to be recorded and it'll be shown on uh, television throughout the state. Uh, in a series of uh, recordings. But the second reason, and I think it's very important, is that one of the problems that I've seen in my life uh, is the lack of historical documentation for the native people in Alaska in our history books. In our history books, you can go to the state uh, history books that are used in the classrooms around the state, and you'll not see anything on these war helmets. You'll not see anything about Anska. You'll not see anything about Roy or Elizabeth Pradovich. You'll not see anything about Anska. The history that we're trying to preserve is a history of our own, of ourselves, of our people. Because nobody's going to tell our history unless we tell it ourselves. And we're really grateful to an individual like Mr. Hendrickson here, who is very knowledgeable about something we don't even know much about. It's people like himself who are going to help us keep the language, keep the history alive about the, these particular pieces of history that belong to us. Now, many of you know that Steve Hendrickson is a curator of collections at the Alaska State Museum, and he's an adjunct instructor at the University of Alaska Southeast in Juneau. He specializes in Clinket material, culture, and art, Clinket art, culture, and history, and war helmets in particular. Mr. Hendrickson's expertise has helped in the preservation and protection of some of Southeast Alaska's most valuable atu. His knowledge of Clinket armor and helmets have helped identify uh, Clinket objects so they could return to Southeast Alaska from er other parts of the world, and, and especially in, in uh, lower 48 of, of, the, of America. Mr. Hendrickson's knowledge has aided in the continuation of education of Clinket history and culture. He has lived in Juneau, Alaska for many years and has been actively in, Organize, organizing the periodic Clinket clan conferences that are so um, uh, prevalent now in Southeast Alaska. His lecture will feature images of armor mostly housed in museums and cultural centers around the world. Mr. Hendrickson has located nearly 100 war helmets in museums and private collections with new ones shown up every year or two. The helmets, elaborately carved with fearsome sculptures of clan crest ancestors and spirits are part of a system of armor that protected the face, body, and appendages of Clinket warriors. The warrior was designed to protect warrior, the, the armor was designed to protect warriors from traditional weapons, arrows, daggers, spears, and clubs, many of which were elaborately decorated by the 19th century. These uh, helmets and warrior, um, protective, protective gear became commonplace when, or became obsolete when high-powered firearms became commonplace because they could penetrate very easily the armor of, uh, that were used. So if, without further ado, I really want to tell you how much I appreciate personally Mr. Hendrickson and his contribution to the Native community and the work that he's done. Would you please welcome Mr. Steve Hendrickson. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Senator Kukesh, and thank you to Rosita and the Sea Alaska Heritage Institute for, for having me. And uh, let me get back to the beginning here. Um, so uh, I, I have been uh, researching this subject for almost 30 years now, and I got my start when I was an undergraduate at Portland State University taking a general art history 101 class. and. Um, you know, I, I uh, studied art from around the world in that class, but I was, I was really fascinated by the art of the Northwest Coast Native people. And uh, our assignment was to write a term paper about one of the many works of art in our, in our um, uh, textbook. And the only uh, example of, North, uh, of Native American art in the textbook was a photograph of a war helmet. 
And that's where I got my start, and I uh, began uh, looking um, in books at that time. This was pre-internet. So I checked out all the books I could about Northwest Coast Art and, and located about 60 or so war helmets and pieces of armor in, in distant museum collections. And then over the years, I just kept that up. And of course, now um, a lot of this is available on the internet at various museum uh, and cultural center websites where you can go up and look at images of things in their collections. But amazingly enough, uh, uh, new armor comes up almost every year now uh, because it had been miscatalogued or otherwise uh, not available in a private collection. But every once in a while, something new will come up. And at the end, I have a few new ones to show you. Since the last time I gave this presentation even, there's, there's still new ones coming up. So it makes it hard to, for me to know when I should stop researching and start writing it up because, you know, it's like, well, I, I'll do this and something else will come up and it'll rewrite everything. But actually, I think, uh, you know, chances are there's, there's not a whole lot more, although because of the nature of the collecting of artifacts on the Northwest Coast, the material has really spread out all over the world with the concentrations being uh, the east coast of North America and in, in Europe, uh, some of the uh, Russian collections and other European countries in their national museums, they've ended up with large collections of Alaska Native artifacts. So um, even though there's a great deal of artistry associated with the armor, uh, I'd like to, to emphasize that it's not just art, it's something that was designed to be functional and it's also a, a story of technology and how uh, over a course of many, many years, the, the armor technology um, was refined to the point where it was perfectly suited for the traditional types of combat that uh, was engaged in. And then uh, even towards the end when firearms did make their uh, appearance on the Northwest Coast and were, <clears throat> were purchased uh, through traders and, and used in combat, even, even then, they, they made efforts to uh, uh, reinforce that armor using uh, the same kind of approach that uh, modern armor makers take, and that's using layers of different kinds of materials. By layering the, those materials up, it has a greater chance of slowing a lead bullet or buckshot down enough to not to be able to penetrate, and I have some examples of that to show you. But um, let's go ahead and get started with some of the images. And I just wanted to, to say, looking around the room here, it's, it's as if this room was designed to have this presentation or presentations on warriors because there's so much art in this room that relates to it. The Bill Holm Raven Warrior print, there's a Sea Alaska poster from early in the, um, the uh, Native Corporation days, and of course the Preston Singletary house post behind me. And uh, is it Mick or Rick's war helmet here? Uh, one of a pair that he did maybe 15 years ago or, or so. So it's really a, a beautiful space to be showing you these images in. Now, I did want to thank uh, several people that have helped me over the years in really understanding uh, the importance of armor and how it was used. George Bennett, Sr., uh, George Ramos and Mark Jacobs Sr., all, all of these men uh, carry parts of the, the story with them and have, have been really uh, willing to, to pass it on and keep it alive. So I really have to thank them a great deal for what, what you're about to see. The Euro early uh, European uh, explorers, or uh, mostly traders, but there were some government expeditions sent up here as well. They, they describe uh, Klingit warriors using armor, in some cases, uh, against them. And they were very concerned about that as a, as a matter of strategy. They tried to um, uh, collect examples of the armor so they could uh, uh, assess the threat that it represented to them. And also, they wanted to um, make a show of force to the natives that they came into contact with. And sometimes they would uh, ask to borrow a piece of armor and they would fold it in half and lean it up against a stump and have their soldiers fire a bullet through it and then show the hole to everybody. So it, from the get-go, the, the message was sent, you know, don't mess with us, your, your armor is really useless. But as we'll see, 
the effort was made to, to not to uh, capitulate, but to reinforce that armor. And uh, you know, it's, uh, it, it, I have mixed emotions about focusing on armor so much be, because I'm concerned that people will get the impression that the Klingets are warlike. And that's something that goes all the way back to the European descriptions of Klingit warriors and other tribes along the coast uh, who were doing nothing more than uh, uh, standing up for their rights. Uh, and the Europeans felt that was warlike, and so they added that to their descriptions. And you know, I'm gonna be talking a lot about armor, but we all know that Klingit culture is, is based on, on love and respect. And very much war was something that everybody wanted to avoid, worked hard to avoid it. And if it did happen, uh, efforts were made to end it very quickly. And I think that armor was uh, uh, not, not only an effective way to protect individuals from harm, but it also it was a check in the cycle of violence that might happen during a war or an extended feud between clans, in that uh, in, in doing battle, you're not creating more casualties that would require uh, an escalation of violence. I think it kept the violence in check so it was all the more easier to to forge peace afterwards. So I think in that way, it really uh, had a use beyond protecting the individual. It protected the clans from decimating each other. So uh, the best early uh, drawing of a warrior in armor f came from the, um, the Spanish artist, Mel uh, Saria, Tomas de Saria, in 1792 at uh, the Yakutat area and his uh, fantastic drawing of a, a, a warrior wearing armor with the helmet, a face protector, and wooden slat armor and thick leather armor underneath it. And it very much coincides with armor collected around the same time. On the right is a set of armor in, in the Peter the Great Museum of Anthropology in St. Petersburg, showing uh, pretty much what you see in the drawing. So. Um, the warrior, incidentally, is holding the bow horizontally, and that, that's the way they, they used it, was hor horizontally rather than the Western style. Uh, much of the wars that took place clan, between clans and, and native nations were, were not fought with armor, even though we have uh, close to you know, 95 examples of war helmets. Uh, I, I think most warriors probably did not do battle with armor. Uh, the types of battles that they had were often required a lot of quick movements, and if you're wearing that armor, it's fairly heavy and bulky and it restricts your movement. So it would only be employed in, in very strategic ways. Typically, a warrior would just have you know, a dagger, uh, other weapons, uh, would tie his hair up in a top knot, Paint, paint his face black and uh, maybe have some hide armor on, if anything. Uh, so, uh, and uh, many wars were just fought with daggers, like the one you see on the, the right that the Tequedi clan in Angoon has. Uh, there's all kinds of other weapons, bows and arrows, spears, and a variety of clubs, including this one, which is a pretty unique one at the American Museum of Natural History. It's a caribou antler and the, uh, the tines of the antler have been sharpened. They're almost like chisel points. And then the handle's on the right, and so you could, with a slashing motion, you could cause a lot of damage by the series of sharpened edges coming into contact. And then, of course, the, the war, uh, a uh, war club or war pick with a, uh, in this case, a jade blade fixed in a wooden handle. And this is probably one of the uh, weapons that that motivated the development of the war helmet because of the you know the the damage that that could inflict on someone, and later on uh, firearms of course first the flintlock variety, and then later the percussion cap type. This is a blunderbuss. There were a few of those traded, but mostly we're dealing with uh, uh, something like a a 65 to 75 caliber smoothbore musket. And in addition to having the musket, you had to have a whole set of accessories to operate it, 
uh, a pouch to keep it all in, a powder horn for the gunpowder. Uh, there's a, a thing for percussion caps, that, that leather disc. There's bullet molds, there's powder measures, and a little powder bag down there. So there's a lot of equipment necessary to operate this. And if you had to pick an environment on Earth that was the least conducive to using this kind of weapon, it would be the Northwest Coast because uh, just the condensation on the metal parts would be enough to fell the uh, gunpowder and cause you to have a misfire. And, and also, these are smoothbore muskets, at least the, the earliest ones introduced, so the accuracy uh, wasn't exactly terrific, although um, it is quite possible for, for you to have a lot of accuracy if you have the time to, to load it properly. But in a, a, a battle context, fighting a, in a style other than what the Europeans did, which was which where you line up, you follow commands to load, and everybody's doing the same thing, and you can consistently press the bullet on top of the powder with the right amount of pressure. You can have a, a patch around the ball so the bullet doesn't roll back and forth in the barrel. All of those steps add to the accuracy, but uh, in a, a Northwest Coast context, it, it, it wouldn't have been like that, and so you wouldn't be able to get the accuracy out of a weapon like this. So uh, there was one account that an uh, early European had that the, uh, in battle, he witnessed a battle between clans, and he said in battle the, the, uh, uh, the sides would watch for a puff of gunpowder, and then they would dive to one side or another because they, there was enough of a lag time there for them to get out of the way of the bullet. But the accuracy here was so poor that you were probably better off just standing stationary <laughs> because you might dive into the path of the bullet. So there's a, a, some of the early Spanish expeditions uh, collected some armor and again this might have been to take back to their own uh, weapons laboratories to study um, and this is from 1792. It's in, the, in Madrid now. It's a, a bear helmet from the Yakutat area. And this is a, probably the most uh, common type of war helmet is one with a humanoid face on it rather than a recognizable crest animal or supernatural creature. It's more of a, a fairly realist, realistic humanoid face and uh, what, that could be an ancestor or, or a spirit. Um, it's very much, it, it looks like it could be a mask that's somehow mounted on a, a dome of wood but they're all always carved out of one piece. And they're carved uh, fairly thick out of thick wood. I mean, it's a solid piece of wood, and they leave it very thick. Uh, the backs are usually just rounded like this and have a form line design. And it's one of the few areas, few types of form line design that they did it on a white background pretty consistently. Uh, they painted it white first and then put a red primary form lines over the, over the uh, top of that. And you really don't see that much in other types of form line decorated objects. So uh, this is a, a, a crest, a, a, a hat that more along the lines of what would be used for ceremonial purposes. It's a, a, a representing a primary crest of a clan. And uh, the function of these is not for protection, it's for representing the clan, for uh, identification uh, of the clan members, and for ritual use at, at kuiks and memorial potlatches. And the, uh, uh, the carver here would try to carve the wood fairly uh, thin uh, to prevent checking. They carve the wood green, and, and it, that's an issue when you're carving to make sure it's well hollowed out and any area that's that's left thick is going to be prone to splitting especially on the thin brim so they tried to make it as thin as possible and then if any checks did open up during the drying process a lot of times they close back up after the wood is completely dry but war helmets are different they are typically carved from a a piece of wood that has twisted grain something like a, a burl from a tree something that's got the grain going all different directions, so it's less prone to splitting, and not only in the drying process, but if you if you hit someone on the head with a 
a war pick, for instance, that a normal piece of wood, that would just open it right up. But with a burled piece of wood with the grain going all over, it, it has a tendency more to stick together. Plus, a lot of these have a heavy uh, layer of rawhide that's uh, formed over the top of them and nailed down or pegged down around the perimeter. So it's a very, it'd be very hard to split that. These are ranged from an inch to an inch and a half in, in thickness, so it's much thicker than the typical crest hat would be. And inside, uh, they would have a layer of padding, something perhaps like this uh, fur cap. In other cases, they actually glued uh, the skins of birds, the body skin, so it has a, a layer of down on the inside to, to cushion uh, the inside. So uh, I'll show a, a couple more uh, examples of the humanoid type of war helmet. There's several that, um, that have very fierce expressions, and, and one of the functions, I think, of war helmets and armor in general is to uh, provide an element of psychological warfare. In, in uh, Alexander Branoff in 17, 1790s was, uh, in the middle of the night, was uh, set upon by a, a group of uh, Klingit warriors, and he has a very vivid descriptions, uh, description of how terrified this made everybody see because these big figures just materialized in the middle of their camp because of the layers of padding they were all really big and tall the helmet might add another six inches to eight inches on top so it just made people think these were big guys and he also said that the the uh, armor was uh, impervious to bullets uh, it's a really interesting account, but some of the uh, the helmets actually have fierce expressions uh, on their uh, carved on the faces to add to that element of psychological warfare. The one on the left actually is the one from Dry Bay that uh, was in my uh, art history textbook that I started writing about this. The one on the right is a beautiful uh, helmet from the Taku River that's at the Smithsonian. And I think uh, it's in the, on display at the uh, Arctic Studies Center in Anchorage now. But that comes from this area. Uh, the one on the right, again, is a, a fairly typical uh, uh, humanoid helmet. Uh, this one has opercula shells in the mouth representing teeth and human hair that's pegged over the, the lip and under the chin to represent facial hair. On the right is the only helmet that depicts a a female. And this one is on display at the Louvre in, in Paris. And we know that because of the labrette that she has in her lip. Unfortunately, there's no documentation with this uh, that would say where it's from or what the, what the image represents. But um, it, it's uh, uh, typically, especially nowadays, the, the, uh, the opinion seems to be that women really didn't have any role in, in warfare that uh, they were not even allowed to handle uh, the armor or weapons, and uh, they basically would have no association with it. But there are a few historical accounts of women participating in battle, and also this, if this is a spirit, it could represent a female spirit. So it's, it's hard to say exactly the meaning here, but it is, like I say, out of uh, 90 some helmets, this is the only one uh, representing a uh, a woman. There's uh, some humanoid helmets that have, you know, maybe four or five of them have a human face and then this kind of a crest over the top, a ridge running from the top of one ear over to the top of the other. And then that, that ridge has form line design on it. These are both really early from the late 1700s, early 1800s. Uh, but probably more common as a group are helmets that represent animals of various sorts. And a few of these we have in the collection records that the museums maintain uh, what the collector uh, said the people he obtained it from said it represented. And this one was collected by George Emmons in Wrangell, I believe, in the late 1800s. And he said this represented a cheek, which is murlet. And from the shape of the body, I think that could very well be accurate. And this is uh, 
there's only two helmets that, um, that I have come across so far that are documented as coming from the Haida, even though in Haida uh, tradition they talk about having armor as well as the Simshian. But this and a, and a um, companion to it, also an eagle, uh, are the only ones that are known to be Haida from Old, old Kassan. Uh, so I'm not sure how, how to explain the, the uh, difference there. It could just be an error in the documentation that the museums have, but, but certainly there's plenty of uh, evidence that both the Haida and Simshian also used uh, war helmets and armor. Uh, some helmets uh, used the head skin of a bear, a brown bear, stretched over a plain wooden form. Uh, to be a war helmet. This is the most elaborate one of those, and it's at the Peabody Museum at Harvard. It has little bear faces that are mounted over the ears of the bear, and m this is missing most of its its fur, and it, it's faded quite a bit, so it looks like kind of like a polar bear now, but it actually is a brown bear. Uh, there's, there's some uh, helmets that uh, you, you know, these are all just educated guesses for the most part. This is not information that's been uh, handed down in clans or in the collector's notes from the time this was collected. These are just educated guesses based on the appearance and sometimes the area, general area where it comes from. This one has no documentation uh, and to try to make sense out of what it is, a lot of people have um, suggested that it's a, a rodent of some kind, maybe a mouse or some other member of the order Rodentia. Um, but, you know, it's still just a, just a guess. It does have the real bulgy eyes that you might associate with a, a rodent of some sort. But whatever it is, that, and, and this is the case across the board, they go to great effort to make it a fierce example of a bird or a mammal or something else. They, they really put expression into it or exaggerate the features in a, a rather fearsome way to add again to that psychological effect. And uh, Alexander Bronoff in his written description of the battle he went through, uh, the first battle he went through, he called them, he said they wore terrifying visages on their heads. So he was really struck by the uh, fearsomeness of the sculpture. So there, there's uh, seven or eight helmets representing whales, a couple representing killer whales with a added piece of wood for the dorsal fin. And this one has a seal in its mouth and that may point to it being from the whale, killer whale chasing seal house of Angoon. Here's a couple more whale helmets, the uh, one at the British Museum on the left the other one's in the Peabody Museum. Uh, the one on the left, uh, probably a whale. The one on the right, it's a little less clear that it's a whale. There's no, no recognizable eyes there or a mouth. Uh, whales usually have broad mouths, sometime with, sometimes with teeth in them. Uh, so, um, you know, it's unclear exactly what that could be. Sea lions are there. They're rather fierce creatures in nature, and so it doesn't take too much exaggeration to make them look fierce in helmet form. This one has actual sea lion whiskers attached to the uh, nose, and possibly sea lion teeth inlaid in the mouth as well. Fairly realistic in, in its uh, depiction, and very much like the way you see their heads when they're swimming through the water, they have their noses up in the air and making all that racket. And there, there's a, some helmets really defy, they're really unique and they defy easy interpretation. And this one, uh, it's very, carved very much like a typical humanoid helmet, but it has uh, its sprouting sea lion whiskers out of the mouth. And it, and it could be one of those examples in Northwest Coast Art that you see of a, of a human transforming into an animal or, or back again. And transformation, uh, according to the old stories, was something that happened uh, a lot, and on the spur of the moment, it, a person could change form, like almost like putting on uh, a set of clothing, uh, just taking on and off a new identity. And uh, this could be an example of that, a, the face of a human that frozen in the process of transformation. 
Here's a, uh, there's a, I, I guess probably five or six helmets representing sharks or dogfish that have um, the uh, kind of this, it's at an upward angle, has a ridge on it that has a form line design representing a hawk according to the documentation. On one side, a large open mouth with nostrils that are kind of like a, uh, they're not really nostrils, but they're on the head of a shark. There's these uh, um, uh, water intakes uh, for the gills in front there. And then on the back, a representation of uh, maybe the tail of the shark or the head where it's not really clear. And this is a, another tr possible transformation helmet that has on, on the left, the image on the left, you can see the human face, but it has this tall uh, forehead. And then right behind the ear, it switches over to a form line um, uh, design. And this is a picture of the, the back of it. And um, if you look, notice right behind the ear, you can see these crescent shapes that are gills. And so it could be a humanoid shark, or at least, uh, you know, or showing a, uh, the, the act of transformation. So, um, you know, in, in trying to come up with uh, different explanations for different kinds of helmets, I've looked pretty broadly around uh, Klingit culture for possible connections. And one of the connections that, that we see is between warfare and shamanism. And the shamans, uh, they were, uh, they were warriors also. They, their job, one of their primary jobs was to bat, do battle with evil spirits or, or the spirits uh, that were aiding enemies in, in real life, in, uh, in the life of people. Uh, they, they had uh, wands and charms that represented, were, were like non-functional replicas of, of actual weapons used by warriors in physical combat. On the left, there is, uh, um, a shaman's war pick. It doesn't have a stone blade. It has a flimsy wooden blade in it, but, and they didn't actually hit anybody with it, but in, their, in the practice of combating evil spirits, they would use their own version of a war pick and also daggers. In this posed photo of a shaman, he's got a, a replica of a dagger that he's fighting spirits that are infecting his patient there below. So he's doing battle with spirits, just like warriors do battle in the physical realm. The, the most typical kind of humanoid war helmet is very similar to the kinds of uh, hats that shamans used when they were doing battle with spirits. The picture on the left is a, a shaman's headdress. On the right is a war helmet. And the way that the face sits right on top of the forehead, kind of sla slanted back, uh, it, it leads to the possibility that maybe uh, warriors are wearing replicas of shaman's gear or shamans are wearing replicas of warrior's gear. Also, if some helmets have small little figurines uh, kind of coming out of the sides of the face, which is something that you see typically on shaman's equipment, including masks, like the one on the right has otters that are coming out of the cheeks and over the forehead, and sometimes on shaman's equipment, those are spirit helpers of the shaman. The shaman has a set of spirit helpers that assist them in doing combat and some of the other things they engage in that are, that are depicted on their artifacts that they use. And, and possibly warriors are doing, doing the same thing. This is a special kind of war, uh, hel uh, shaman's headdress that is called in the literature a war hat, a war bonnet. And shamans uh, are said to use this kind of uh, headgear when they actually accompany warriors into battle. When they're in their canoes going to the, the battle, they, put the, they, they go into a trance and they fly ahead of the war party to spy on the enemy, to see where they're holed up at. And they also, in the process, they encounter the, the uh, shaman of the other side, and they actually have combat in the spirit world as well. And for that, they use this type of, of headdress. There's uh, about five war helmets that are replicas of that kind of shaman's hat. They're, they're, uh, they are 
they're flexible. The shaman's versions are, and they put up, you put them on the head, and they have kind of a, they're kind of flat from each side, kind of like the old style Boy Scout hats that you can tuck in your belt, or you open them up and put them on. Um, these, though, are, are solid wood, so they're not flexible, and they're thick enough, again, to prevent uh, damage in, in warfare. So another, you know, another connection, uh, albeit somewhat tenuous, between armor and shaman's equipment is that apparently sometimes the uh, helmets and armor were disposed of in graves or by leaving them out in the elements and letting them deteriorate naturally. On the right is a, a war helmet that's in the Sheldon Jackson Museum collection that was found somewhere and it, it had been in the process uh, deteriorated substantially uh, by the elements. On the left is Steve Brown's interpretation of what that once looked like based on what's left of it and traces of paint that are still on it. That's another sea lion helmet. And there's a, this uh, amazing set of three helmets that was uh, found by hunters on Prince of Wales Island or one of the islands in the vicinity. It was just found out in the middle of the woods in the remains of a bentwood box. There was no human remains present. It was just left out there. And uh, these, I, th I believe, were from the uh, uh, Tongass National Forest. And so the Forest Service has been in the process of repatriating these. But uh, this one actually is a humanoid helmet, very early looking sculpture. And it, it must have been laying upside down because the, uh, more than half of it is just not there anymore. And then this other one, uh, uh, this is Bill Holmes' interpretation of what it once looked like there on the lower left. Um, it, uh, it's been interpreted as a merganser from the shape of the head, the teeth that are in the beak, which is, you know, you normally don't think of birds having teeth, but uh, mergansers have have serrations in their beak that help them catch fish. And they also have a little crest of feathers on the back of the head. So that could be what's going on here. Uh, so uh, keeping, you know, turning again to the rest of the armor system, it was the helmets were part of this whole system that covered most of the vital areas of the body. And um, it consisted of a wooden face protector that was held right underneath the helmet and then uh, body armor, either wooden slat armor twined together with uh, nettle fibers or sinew, um, and also uh, uh, leather or rawhide using the thickest um, leather available, moose or in some cases sea lion, and, and elk uh, hides from the Columbia River were for some reason very highly uh, sought after on the northern northwest coast. So the face protector, it, it, it slides up right underneath the helmet and, and the intersection between them is right at eye level. So there's little divots in the top of the face protector so you could see out of. And the way this is held up is that uh, the warrior slides it up into place and bites on, uh, there's the eye openings. And on the inside there's a, a little bite block that you hold that up against your face by biting on that loop of spruce root. And it's so close that they had to drill a breathing hole. You can see that right in the front of these uh, visors um, so that the warrior could, could breathe out of. You can see those, um, those little um, depressions there for the eye uh, right along the top. Um, let's see. Uh, mostly uh, in museum collections, the visors or the face protectors were not collected usually with the helmets. They were separated, but there are a few uh, exceptions to that. This one's at the uh, William uh, Seward House in Auburn, New York, when uh, after Seward left office as Secretary of State, he came up to Alaska a year or two later just to take a look at it. He had never been here. And during that visit, he collected a small group of cl mostly Klingit and some Haida artifacts and had this helmet and a face protector were collected together. And, and both the helmet and the face protector, 
or show signs of deterioration. So that you know could have been in a grave or otherwise was exposed to the elements. And um, you know, in talking to people about you know why would you just if it wasn't part of a grave, why would you just leave something out in the middle of the woods to let it deteriorate? And uh, one of the people said it's too, you know, too powerful to keep but too, and too powerful to destroy. And so you, you leave it alone and back away from it and just let it go back to its elements. So there, this is another helmet that has a face protector that's associated with it, a frog. And this one, uh, both of those are deteriorated, as you can see. So this could have been from a shaman's grave where it was pretty typical for you to place shaman's equipment with the shaman in a grave house uh, or some other circumstance where it was left out to the elements. It's another, another one. These are bent wood construction. So they have, they're curved on the inside like the corners of a bent wood box, but the curves are spaced about every inch. And then you steam that and bend it bend a flat board into a circle that matches the, the uh, diameter of the helmet. Then this, uh, the body armor, the slat armor, is made out of hardwood that's uh, twined just like a basket together as if the, the slats of wood were, were the warps and the, and the sinew was the wefts uh, uh, twining them together. And it's possible that weavers, you know, female weavers might have been in charge of putting these together. And on the sides, there's even design work that's done on the sides where the slats turn into uh, rods where it goes around the sides of the body. Uh, you can see there's different textures there, and that's in bands on the sides. So they're doing, it's the same thing as skip stitch in a basket. And they even made similar uh, twined armor for the legs and upper arms as well. So they could had the capability of covering someone from head to foot with this traditional armor, although that would severely limit your mobility. And uh, so that warriors wearing all of this probably had to have people helping them to, to watch their back and to help guide them around even in some cases. So the leather armor is, is a fairly common. The State Museum has a couple of plain pieces of it, and most, mostly it wasn't decorated like the ones you, you see here, which are you know, beautiful examples of form line painting. Um, this one is a killer whale, and it ex the, the head of the whale extends around the side of the body. And this is a really interesting one. I mentioned that Columbia River elk skins were highly sought after, and some of the early Europeans got wind of that, and they made trips from the Columbia River buying up all the elk hides that they could and sending them to the Klingit. And this one, um, interestingly enough, it has you know, sides on it that are beautifully painted form line, uh, but on the inside, it's something completely different. And I think this is a, a Columbia River painting that, uh, and it was probably made up as, a, as armor, and when it got up to Alaska, they, they liked the, the hide, but they didn't like the painting, and they turned it inside out and did form line painting <clears throat> on the other side. So this has been uh, folded to the inside for a couple hundred years, and it's in beautiful shape, and actually there's really not much uh, that survived from the Columbia River as far as this kind of painting, so it's a very, very precious object from that standpoint, as well as it being involved in this trade to the Klingits. There is a, a, a watercolor from the early 1800s by Mikhail Tikhanov showing a warrior at Sitka wearing a piece of hide armor that has a painted design on it that is definitely not Klingit. <clears throat> and I think this, <clears throat> this uh, design with the alternating background colors and the way the mouth is, is very, very much a Columbia River type design. And Tikhanov was so accurate with his, his art that he would not have just made up something and put it on there. His, uh, his images of, of Aleut and uh, Chugash or Alutic and Klingit people are just dead on in every respect. And so it's very, uh, very probable that, that that is a Columbia River design. This is another fragment of armor 
from the Columbia River that uh, was collected from the Simshan. There's a, the, some of the earliest armor is, uh, it looks like a shirt, but it's a lot thicker than a typical caribou hide shirt would be. Uh, uh, sometimes these are collected from the Denina, Athabascan, sometimes Klingit, uh, but many of them have strips of quill work across the front. And this is uh, not porcupine quill work, but bird quill work using the, the center part of a feather. Then the veins are stripped off and then they split the feather and dye, dye it different colors. And uh, then they make these long strips and apply them to the front of the armor shirt. Uh, so looking, uh, looking at some of the armor details, uh, there was this one uh, long uh, set of armor at the American Museum of Natural History that had, had a sleeve. Uh, usually the armor is, is sewn shut on one side and it's just open on one side so you have to take it over your head and put it down and then tie some toggles on the other side. And so the, the idea was that you presented the closed face of the armor to the enemy and you had your your dagger um, in your, uh, lashed into your hand on that side as well. And on that side of this uh, piece of armor, there's a sleeve that's pretty rare. And it has a separate little oval of wood that, or of hide that's sewn on there to protect the thumb. So you could have your dagger in here and your whole hand, back of the hand and thumb would be protected. And the only place I've seen that before is on sa samurai armor from Japan. And their armor sleeves have that same kind of back of the hand and thumb protector. So uh, in Northwest Coast collections, you sometimes see this rectangular armor made up of rods twined together. And usually the, the documentation is pretty vague as far as exactly what this is. It, it, usually it says, you know, it was meant to wrap around the trunk of the body to protect the vital organs. But the trouble is that it's not long enough to go um, or totally around your body. There's no opening for the arm. And if you wear it underneath the arms, it's long enough, it goes down to your knees and you wouldn't be able to walk. So that doesn't really make a lot of sense, but some of it has um, some arm loops on it that suggest it was put over the shoulders and worn kind of like a backpack. And you know you have to wonder, well, what good would that really do? But um, you can find these figures of shaman wearing something like that on their backs, either up to protect the back of their heads or in a down position. And, and the descriptions of these say that the, the shaman is doing battle with, with spirits. And so this could be a clue as to how that kind of armor was used. And um, another clue that we have is by looking to Siberia, to the Chukchi and other uh, Siberian native groups that had back armor as part of their style of armor. And this was sometimes made out of rigid uh, pieces of wood covered with leather. Uh, sometimes it was pieced together, but the, the, uh, these were used in, in, in arrow comb uh, fighting with bows and arrows. And uh, the warriors would be able to, when they saw arrows coming in, you could turn your back and they would bounce off your armor and then you could wheel around quickly and fire your arrows back. And there's quite a few examples of that kind of armor in different museum collections. And uh, sometimes they have kind of a pointed top rather than being rectangular. And there's a, this piece of armor on the lower left is in the National Museum of the American Indian. And it's a very perfect replica of one of those Chukchi back plates with the peaked top. But this one has ovoids on it, so it's probably from uh, the Northwest Coast. And just uh, another type of back armor from the Arctic is made up of slabs of walrus tusks that are, are uh, connected together, sometimes bone. And this one has a, a protector that goes around the back of the head that's made out of full slabs of a walrus tusk that are tied together. You can see the curvature of them. So I think this would have been even heavier than, than Klingit wooden armor having, having full slabs of walrus ivory. So I mentioned the uh, effort to reinforce the armor and uh, some of the uh, body armor shows uh, some of the, those efforts. Uh, 
by adding a layer of uh, Chinese coins to, to the outer surface. Um, the Chinese coins, these were uh, trade items that uh, some of the, uh, f the sea otter uh, fur traders brought from China. They were able to buy these barrels of old coins from past dynasties. These are, has, have been dated to the 1200s and 1400s, so they're well before the sea otter fur trade got going out here. They were just, just stockpiled in warehouses in China. They were able to get a good deal on them. They brought them out here, and, and uh, Northwest Coast na natives use them for decorating their regalia, but also uh, there's efforts made to, to add another layer to maybe make the, uh, the armor more um, impermeable to bullets and buckshot. And here's a piece of uh, leather armor that has a layer of wooden slats added to the inside. And, uh, there was some effort to, to wear the um, armor in layers so you get that extra protection uh, from the different types of materials. And that will slow down a, a bullet better than just a single layer of the same kind of material. Another, um, but, but you know, sooner or later, uh, by the mid-1800s, it is clear that um, new armor was no longer being made. And, and so I think the introduction of firearms had something to do with that, possibly missionary influence uh, or interference from the Russians and later the Americans who, who really wanted to try to uh, stifle um, uh, outbreaks of violence among Alaska natives. And, um, you know, another, uh, another um, but the armor was, was very important as, uh, as as uh, sacred objects to the Klingit, so they weren't, even though they may not be using it in combat anymore, it was still certain pieces of it were used the same way that a crest hat or a chilcat robe might be used in a, a, in a ritual context. It was uh, used as at u, a sacred object owned by the entire group. This uh, helmet is from Wrangell, and it's had, it's been repainted, and these giant pectoral fins were actually sewn onto it using a piece of leather. You can see the stitches there, just to make it a more flamboyant crest object. And here's an old uh, helmet representing the sun dog that uh, shows up in several uh, photographs from the late 1800s. Uh, this, this is a posed photo of a man wearing that helmet and uh, wearing a, a armor-like shirt and holding a blunderbuss. And the same helmet is over at the, at the left, uh, the, next to the man holding a mask, there's a man wearing that same helmet from Klukwan. And uh, he's with some, some people from the Gunnak Tady, although that's probably not where the helmet originated. <clears throat> and then this helmet is also uh, from a photo taken of guests arriving at a potlatch in Klukwan in the 1890s. And this man is uh, wearing the helmet, no other piece of armor, just the helmet, and holding a rifle as the guests are coming in. And, you know, uh, that helmet ended up in the Field Museum in Chicago. And, you know, the, the uh, potlatches or kuiks, even though they bring together uh, clans that might have been uh, at best rivals and at worst uh, the combatants in a feud or, or war at some point in the past, they're peaceful events, of course, but at the beginning there's a, a bit of ritual where the guests approach the host's village and the hosts run out and say, halt, who goes there? And the guests say, oh, we're here for the potlatch that you invited us to remember. And then the hosts say, oh yes, yes, that's, that's right, that is today, isn't it? Well, come on ashore, and they invite them <coughs> to come ashore. And uh, in the beginning there, there's sometimes uh, inferences to to uh, battle, and sometimes they might hold rifles or have uh, a bit of armor on. One of the more famous war helmets in existence is the one that was used by the Kiksuti warrior Catlian at the uh, Battle of Sitka in 1804, and this helmet is in the Sheldon Jackson Museum today. And uh, there's photos of it also being used as uh, a crest object. And that helmet comes out periodically for Kiksuti 
uh, rituals. This is the uh, uh, bicentennial of the Battle of Sitka in, in uh, uh, 2004. The clan hosted a totem pole raising and a large uh, event uh, in Sitka, and the, the war helmet there is in the in the plexiglass cube. It has a, a hide covering, and the the fur and the hide itself is actively coming off. So. Uh, the clan, as well as the museum, felt that it would be better if that was not handled or worn. And really, the clans don't typically wear these helmets in ceremonies. They, they hold them, or they might hold them over someone's head to give them strength. But they're typically not worn. And in the same, in the same philosophy, I guess, that you don't pull a sword out of, your, uh, out of the scabbard unless you're ready to use it. You don't put the armor on unless you're ready to, to drop everything and go to battle. <clears throat> Here is the uh, uh, totem pole that they put up there in the park in Sitka. It actually has a representation of the raven helmet there at the bottom. There's a lot of information on this in the Downhowers uh, book with Lydia Black on the battles uh, of, of uh, 1802 and 1804. Another old, uh, well-documented uh, helmet is this uh, eagle uh, helmet from Angoon, and uh, Sam Newman was the last caretaker of it, as far as I know. There are a few contemporary helmets that sh uh, that show up in ceremonies today. This is one that is frequently brought out. I think Joe Zuboff carved this one, and it's brought out when they have uh, they, they typically have a um, an, uh, a portion of the ceremony honoring veterans. And in this case, uh, uh, the uh, George Bennett and uh, I can't think of his name, is holding the helmet over uh, uh, Pete Karras, a veteran who, you know, to give him strength as he, uh, he battles uh, illness. So uh, 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 some of the, uh, like I said, a lot of the armor has ended up in distant museum collections and there's a lot of interest today in trying to learn more about it and possibly get some of it back. This is uh, Ray Wilson, the Kicksetti, head of the Kicksetti, looking at uh, armor that was very well, might have been collected by Alexander Baranoff at the battle that he did with the Kicksetti that's now in the Peter the Great Museum. And I've, been, I've had the great privilege of traveling around with elders uh, looking at museum collections, and here's Mark Jacobs holding a killer whale a helmet, and Cyril George holding uh, uh, the eagle helmet from Angoon, and it's been quite an experience hearing what they have to say about these. And a few uh, contemporary artists have done modern uh, representations of armor. Tommy Joseph is probably the most prolific of those, and he had an exhibit a few years ago at the State Museum, and his, his, his material has been all over the world at this point. And this is a piece of, uh, a set of armor that we were able to purchase from him with, with the uh, support of the Rasmussen Foundation, and that's on exhibit in our museum now. And he, uh, this is one, is the only helmet that he's ever carved out of yew wood, and he, he said he would never do it again, probably because of how hard that wood is. And a few, a few other artists, uh, Preston Singletary did a representation of a shark helmet there on the left out of glass. Um, uh, I can't think of his, Matthew Helgeson did the killer whale helmet. Uh, De Stan Bevan did the helmet and visor set on the left. And this is another one by Mick Beasley with a face protector. And artists have uh, used the images of armor and, and war helmets specifically for uh, contemporary art. Tannis Selton uh, did this installation that featured images of that dry bay uh, war helmet that I, that I saw in my textbook. And she did some drums that has that imagery on it representing uh, uh, Klingit uh, resistance to colonization. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, it seems like every year or two now, new helmets are coming out of the woodwork, either at auctions or museums are discovering it in their own collections. Uh, this one is uh, uh, from a museum in Berlin, an old uh, helmet that I haven't seen pictures of the other side, but it may have a slot 
in it for a dorsal fin. It does look kind of whale-like. This is one that showed up unexpectedly at an auction in uh, the New England and sold for over a million dollars. Uh, this was about six years ago. No documentation. This one appeared at an auction, a little auction house in France about uh, 15 years ago. And uh, I, I got a fax from somebody that happened to be traveling back there and saw this in an auction catalog and said, hey, you guys should try to try to purchase it. And I thought it was uh, obscure enough that the, the wealthy collectors wouldn't know about it. And so I contacted the Sea Alaska Corporation and they put up, I think, at 25,000, and we had about the same amount in our acquisitions fund at the time. And um, we decided to try to buy this back. And if, if we succeeded, we would work out some kind of a sharing arrangement to exhibit it. And I, I arranged to bid over the phone. It was like 3 in the morning when they called me. And it was all in French. And I had my English-French dictionary out, and I was, I was uh, uh, really afraid I was going to say the wrong uh, dollar amount and end up owing them several hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> uh, but uh, anyway, it didn't come to that. Within a minute, the, the bid was already over at six hundred and some thousand dollars for this one. And it's, again, no documentation. It was just found in a castle in France, but it's clearly Klingit. And uh, the, the idea possibly is that it represents, again, a merganser that has the uh, teeth and the beak and the crest of hair on the top of the head. And this is the most recent one that's come up. This was uh, cataloged as an Aleut headdress in a museum in uh, Massachusetts. And uh, they, they sent me a photo of it and they said, hey, you know, there's some thought that this might not be an Aleut headdress. Do you have any idea what it is? And, and I asked to see a picture of the inside of it, which would tell me how thick it was because no, nothing but a war helmet would be left that thick. And they sent it to me and it was clearly another war helmet, you know, a, not well documented, but that's clearly what it is and a pretty spectacular one as well. So, uh, and, th and finally, this is, um, this is a, uh, a historical photo of a Taku chief lying in state. I blacked out his face, but um, this shows an array of clan crest objects laid out around him as, as is the tradition to surround a, a deceased person or even a dying person with the at u to give them strength. And uh, among these on the uh, net right next to the, the deceased is what looks like a war helmet, but it always threw me because it, um, it didn't have a mouth. It just had kind of a a grid work of design across there. It didn't seem to have a mouth anyway. But uh, this has recently surfaced and uh, I've seen enough photos of it from the side and top to know that that also is a war helmet. But we don't really know anything about it other than this is uh, an elder of the Yanyedi clan of the Taku Klingit. And uh, so that's another one to add to the list which uh, you know, that was just a few months ago that we saw these other photos of it. So um, I think with that, um, I would like to thank you for, um, for coming to the presentation today. And I'd be happy if, you ha if anyone has questions, feel free to ask them now or you can save them for later. But uh, again, thank you very much for, for listening to me. Steve. Yes. Uh, right here, Rosita here. Oh, uh, well, first of all, thank you very much. Really informative. Uh, I missed, I've missed your previous one, so I really appreciate this. Um, but I'm wondering, I have two questions. Have you done any really uh, comparative, systematic comparative uh, studies of helmets in particular? I could see some of the other armor where you could see the relationship, you know, to Chuck Chi and elsewhere. But have we done, have you done or has anyone done a, a real systematic comparative study of, of clinket armor and especially the helmets? Uh, to, <clears throat> well, there, there's really, um, I, I guess I, I would have to say it's not too systematic of a comparison, but, but a 
a fairly uh, detailed look ar at other cultures really around the world that have a tradition of armor. And there really is nothing exactly like Klingit armor. Um, there are some um, uh, native peoples in uh, Polynesia and Asia that have something similar. Uh, and even Africa, there is one tribe there that has a, uh, a tradition of back armor that's similar to this. But, but nothing very, very consistent. It seems like the, the northern Gulf of Alaska from Siberia around to southeast is really a, kind of a, a one area that this type of armor, the helmets as well as the uh, body armor is somewhat similar. But uh, uh, as far as helmets go specifically, uh, a lot of the other um, tribes in the North Pacific area did not do helmets for whatever reason. Uh, there's a few around that are made up of slats that just protect the top of the head, but nothing exactly like what we see from southeast Alaska, and especially nothing like the face protector that, that goes underneath it. The closest thing I've been able to find to that is the samurai warrior tradition that has a mask that's uh, attached to a helmet. But beyond that, you know, really not, not a lot, not, nothing directly comparable. So some some work to be done then. Yes. Um, my second question is, um, I was really intrigued by um, the hat from Angoon with a killer whale, probably Dakloedi, and the seal in the mouth, uh, probably Tsakwedi, and it um, there's a an a oral oral tradition. I don't know if you know about that one that may be related to Wilson. Wilson Cove and mm. the human remains that were found there. Oh, uh, I'm wondering, have you done any dating on any of them? Do we have any real hard data um, as to the earliest? Uh, no, uh, as far as I, I know, there has never been any, any kind of uh, scientific dating, meth dating method used to on the wood that the helmets are carved out of. Um, it's the dates that we have are based on on the style of design, and that's a pretty, you know, a relatively crude way of doing it. But uh, the thing is that radiocarbon dating doesn't doesn't work that well for anything that's less than a couple hundred years old, and some of the armor clearly is 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 from that period. So you might get a date, but then it'll be, you know, it'll be. Uh, 250 years old, plus or minus 500 years, so it doesn't, it doesn't really tell you a whole lot. And plus, it's you know using old growth um, wood. The the date is just when the tree stopped being alive, and so it's possible that that wood from you know that from a tree that stopped living long ago was taken up and carved more recently. So that has a possibility of throwing it off too. I guess you know one of the primary reasons that more dating hasn't been done is probably the expense of the lab work getting it done. It's it can be a thousand dollars to get a date one date, and so you know a lot of the budgets don't allow for for that kind of thing. I know many of you came just for the lunch hour, so we apologize for keeping just a little bit over, but I'm sure you're interested enough to stay there. But thank you very much again, Mr. Hendrickson. Really appreciate this. Keep your eye open for the next uh, series. We really appreciate you all being here. Have a good afternoon. Thank you.